So that's the edges on the screen right fixed. Now, you may be asking why we can't just grab a paint node and quickly paint up these edges rather than going through the hassle of creating this setup here. And the answer is, you can do it that way. In fact, it's often a good way of doing it and it's often the best way of doing it. You just need to be selective about when you do it. So here for example, it's going to be a lot easier to paint this out by hand than to try and draw some co complicated roto shape of his hand. There's so much movement and motion blur on this arm that you can easily get away with just manually painting it. Where you want to avoid frame by frame painting is areas like here. It's easy to make the mistake of thinking frame by frame painting will be the easiest or the quickest way of doing something. So you paint up 10 frames or so and it's looking all good on a frame by frame basis and then you play it back and it's boiling and it's popping and it just looks like shit. Because using this air here as an example, there's so little difference between consecutive frames that any difference in your paintwork between frames is going to stand out. That's why this works, because there's so much motion and the content of the frame is changing so much that you would never notice any inconsistency in the paint from one frame to another. But in areas like this, we need a more procedural method to fix the edge here, which we'll go into in a minute. But for now, let's just get these edges down here. So since we're going to be doing some frame by frame painting, we need to adjust our setup over here. We're going to be doing something similar to what we did over here with our clean frame. So let's just copy those nodes and hook it up over here instead. and we'll just delete the contents of the paint node. And let's just paint up a frame here. So this is what we're going to be mixing in here, which is not ideal because we don't have any buffer around the marker. So if we mix this in, we're going to be revealing a lot of our green screen that we don't want to do. So let's dilate out our mask of the alpha by quite a bit, let's say by 40 pixels. The key mix is mixing in A here, so it's mixing in the RGB and the alpha of A. So we need to just add a full alpha in here, so it's always going to be using this alpha. And there, that's better. So let's go back to the start of the range and just step through and clean up the remnants of this marker. And then we'll do the head. Now that we have it all set up, we have the option of doing one or the other. So this one here looks like a good candidate for just a manual paint. One of the beauties of motion blur is that it generally means that things are moving quite quickly, so small imperfections in paintwork are not going to be noticed uh, very easily. So it generally doesn't have to be perfect. This shouldn't be a, you know, an excuse to do a shit job, it just means you don't have to spend quite as much time on it.
Alright, let's go back to this marker up here. Okay, so there's a problem up here, but um, we'll just continue with what we're doing and we'll come back and fix this later. So let's move on to this marker up here near the helmet. For this one, we're going to use a more automated edge extend method. So let's make another little setup here, and we're going to need to do some roto for this too. Um, so you can just watch me roto for the next two minutes. I'm just going to move it and adjust the feather on each frame. Uh, this is not how you roto, but this is just the easiest way for this one little edge. Uh, it's jumping around on each frame and there's no real good way to track the roto in. Now we want to copy our alpha across, but we don't want the feather because we want to extend the edge from the hard edge of this alpha. So let's do our little clamp trick again. But this time we want anything that doesn't have a value of 1 to have a value of 0. So this time set the minimum to 1 and enable the min clamp to and the max clamp to.
And now we're going to do a slightly different edge extend setup, which is straight from the edge extend gizmo that you can find online. So it's an edge blur and an unpremolt and a level set node. And in the level set node, we need to tick create mat and then select RGBA in extrapolated channels. Now we dilate it out. And we can adjust how much it's blurring the edge pixels before it's extending them. We need to be careful not to blur it too much on frames like this because we're going to be blurring out the values that we're trying to extend, which are these red values here. So you can see what happens when we increase the blur. So to complete our little setup here, we need to copy back in our original alpha and then we're going to pre-mult the RGB by that alpha information. And so there it is, we have our edge fixed roto, and we can go back to our key mix and start painting up those edges now.
So as you can see, that's a much faster way of fixing edges, and it requires no actual painting other than when you're key mixing it in. This method works really well when there's not a huge amount of motion blur happening, and the foreground subject is sort of just hovering over the marker. Because it's in those situations we need something that is going to be consistent from frame to frame, so we don't get any boiling or popping. And so long as your roto is accurate, because it does really come down to the accuracy of your roto, both the inside hard edge and the feathered edge. This is a method that will definitely give you consistency. Unfortunately, this method is not going to work in all situations, on account of how the edge extend works. For example, on this frame, I would expect that it's not going to do a good job, because there's a lot of motion blur, and the rotor is fairly complex. But let's look to see what it does. So yeah, that, that doesn't look good. Uh, we're getting this hard contrast here, and we're also getting these artifacts. But, you know, as you use these techniques more and more, you're just going to know through experience when one technique is not going to work. And actually, there's another little marker down here, which I didn't notice. Uh, and this looks like a really good candidate for the automated edge extend. So I'll just quickly do that now as well. So we're having a little issue here with our edge extend with this hard edge. Often you'll get these sort of issues if you have any sharp angles like we have here because the edge extend is basically just extending the color out parallel to the spline. So you get them sort of budding into each other and, uh, and you get this sort of result. You can try to play with the settings of your edge extend but sometimes the best option is just to manually fix it with some paint strokes. Either that or go with one of our other options we have. 
but this is just one or two frames, so we can just fix this manually, I think. So I forgot about this little issue up here, so we'll just quickly fix this up before we move on. And we're going to deal with it essentially the same way, uh, but instead of keying off our roto shape, we're going to key off our paint node. And we're just going to do that by keying it off at the root. So now we need to update our pre-comp, um, and instead of rendering out the whole thing, let's just render out these few frames that we've fixed. We're having a hard time getting this one to match because our alpha is not accurately representing what's happening in the plate here for some reason. We can either try fake it by extending the feather out past where it should be, but we can also play with the feather fall off to increase the strength of our alpha here and get the result we're after. And there we have it, all the markers have been removed. Now let's combine the alpha for our edge fixing to the alpha of our mark marker removal patches. And then copy the final alpha over our B stream. And we'll pre molt that. Now to the final stage of our paint, regraining. There are automated ways of regraining, such as the F regrain node, but we're going to build our grain from scratch because it's something you really need to learn how to do in paint. So we're going to take our denoise plate and our original grain plate over here, and we're going to use the grain node. And the green node needs an alpha, so let's just give this plate an auto alpha. Now, the way we're going to do this is we're going to hit one on the plate and two on the denoise plate, and then we're going to use the swipe. And we're basically only going to go channel by channel and play with these numbers until we get it pretty close.
So let's start in the red channel. So on the left here is our regrained plate. So this is the one we need to match. So we're matching left to right. So first off, it's way too strong. So let's dial down the intensity. It also looks too big, so let's pull the size down as well. And that looks pretty close. Now onto the green channel. So let's dial down the intensity quite a lot. And reduce the size quite a bit too. And finally the blue channel. Let's reduce the intensity. And this grain actually looks maybe a little bit small. So let's bump it up just a bit. And there we go, that's close enough. It's pretty close actually. And so back here we want to merge our paint over our original plate. And then we want to take our grain node and then place it under the merge node. And the grain is only the grain node is only going to apply the grain through the alpha, which is coming through the merge node. And there we have it, our beautifully regrained paint. Now something I always do as a way of quality checking my work is using a merge difference node with my finished paint in the original plate. And this is going to show any difference and if you slam the exposure you can see it much more clearly. And we're just making sure that nothing has been altered that doesn't need to be altered. And it doesn't look like there are any issues at all with that. Yep, we're seeing exactly what we expect to see. And so there you go, we have successfully removed those green screen markers and we have done so in a reasonably elegant uh, way. And by that I mean we haven't done unnecessary destruction to the plate. And that really is the name of the game. I'm just going to add another grade node here just to make sure that all our alpha values are nice and full just in case we've done any paint up here that's sort of semi opaque. I don't always do this, uh, sometimes it can have the undesirable effect of making your patches too sharp um, which can make any differences in the grain uh, stand out. Um, although if your grain is accurate that shouldn't be a problem. But often I'll do it just as kind of a redundancy just in case I've done some paint up above and I've been painting with a low opacity and for, for whatever reason I've either forgotten to grade the alpha or something else has happened. Just to make doubly sure that any paintwork we've done is, is being accounted for in this alpha. So before we wrap up, just a quick word on the workflows I've been illustrating here. It should go without saying that none of this is gospel. These are just some methods I use, and obviously everybody works differently. Some of the methods I've used here I don't actually use very often, but I've included them as sort of other options that you can resort to. My hope is just that you see some value here, and you can pick up some tips that you can integrate into your workflows. 
Or if you're a bit newer to Nuke and you don't really have uh, established workflows, then you can maybe use what I've illustrated here as a starting point and then go from there. But the way you work will change over time. You'll just naturally sort of veer towards a style of working that is comfortable to you. Having said all that, the overall workflow I've used here of denoising, isolating your paint, putting that back over your original plate, and just regraining the painted portion of the plate is a standard workflow and should really always be used except in rare cases. And I definitely swear by working in this structured way where you have a master alpha in a separate stream. It's a workflow that I've sort of developed over time, although I'm sure it's not unique. But it's born out of what I consider to be the number one rule of paint, which is preserve as much of the original plate as possible, only alter what you absolutely need to alter, and leave the rest untouched. And I always find that working like this helps me to achieve that because the only things you're adding to the alpha are the things that you are changing in the plate, some combination of patches and paint strokes. And because we're pre molting at the end, nothing that's not in the alpha channel is going to make it through. It's a reliable workflow and a much better idea than creating a separate alpha to mask the area of your paint. Not only will you be affecting areas you don't need to, you can also accidentally miss areas that you have done work on that you want to be affecting. Anyway, I hope that makes sense. Now the last step is to write out our finished paint. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this tutorial and that you've learned something. It is my first tutorial, so I apologize if I was doing anything that was annoying. Uh, if I was doing anything annoying, please let me know what those annoying things were so I can not do them in my next tutorial. And in future tutorials, I do plan on tackling some more challenging tasks. I'm aware this is not a particularly challenging task, or maybe it was challenging enough for you depending on your experience level. but. I trust you guys understand that it's more my workflow here that I that I wanted to illustrate. And I thought that best illustrated on something not overly uh, complex. Also, because it's my first tutorial, I didn't really want to attempt anything too daunting first up. But um, rest assured, my next tutorial will cover a more advanced level task. I really want to do a tutorial on warping, so using the spline warp and the grid warp a lot um, because they are such important tools in this job and you'll use them on almost a daily basis and the tutorials out there on warping are really lacking in just just in the number of them and also just what they cover or don't cover but please do give me any feedback you have good or bad and I'll embed my details here actually if you have any questions at all related to the industry or looking for some advice, um, then feel free to ask any questions at all. And yeah, again, just uh, thanks a lot for watching. Hey guys, welcome back to this, our bonus material. So I've put together a script here illustrating another cleanup workflow that I use quite often. And this one utilizes geometry and a camera to stabilize the shot, making it much easier to do cleanup on shots with a moving camera. So let's do a little walkthrough of our setup here. So we have our denoise Iron Man plate here and I've also pulled in our shot camera and our wall geometry and once again we are projecting our plate onto the wall geometry but notice that there's no frame hold in this setup so we're projecting our moving plate through our shot camera onto our set geometry now here's the trick inside our scanline render node this projection mode is by default set to render cam. And you can see if we look at that, nothing is changing here. The scanline render is basically rendering what the camera is seeing, and the camera is seeing what the camera is projecting, which is the plate. But look what happens when we set this to UV instead.
So here, instead of rendering what the camera is seeing, it is rendering the texture that is being projected onto the card by the camera. So you could consider this to be sort of a moving UV texture map for our card. It can sometimes take a little bit of time to wrap your mind around this sort of setup and how this is stabilize how this stabilization is working. But if the 3D relationship between the camera and your geometry is accurate, there are a few ways you can stabilize your shot at a certain point in 3D space. This setup obviously we are stabilizing at the plane of the wall because that's the only geo we have. But if this was a shot where the set had more depth and we had additional geo for the set, we could stabilize it at any point in 3D space just by placing a card at the correct depth and projecting onto it like this. One thing to be aware of is that the resolution of this result is actually dependent on the size of the card. So if I was to enlarge this card, the relative size of the projection becomes much smaller. And so not only will it be more difficult to paint, but it's also scaling the image down significantly, which is going to result in massive image degradation when we reverse the stabilization. So as you can see, as we enlarge the card, basically the worse our result is going to be. So you want to make the card as small as possible. As small as possible, but still large enough that it's going to fit the whole range of our camera move within the frame. So now that we have this stabilized, we can create a paint node and set our strokes to all. And then we can just paint out our markers. So this is kind of a best of both worlds solution. We have all the benefits of a live method, uh, which means we're avoiding a lot of setting keys on gray nodes, and we don't have to do any manual tracking. So after we've painted out the marker, we need to reverse the steps we've taken here. So recall that what we've output here is essentially a texture map created by projecting our footage onto our card. The process for reversing that would be to apply the texture map onto the same card and then filming that card through our shot camera. And that's what we're doing here with our apply material node. This node is going to map whatever texture map we give it onto the UVs of the geometry. And then the last step is to render the card through the shot camera and there we have it, we have reversed our stabilization and the paint is there, we can see it. Cool. One very important consideration to make here is what we touched on before, which is what sort of degradation is happening to the plate here. As you can see, it's resulted in a pretty substantial softening of the plate, which is definitely not good at all. The reason for that is it's essentially being scaled down so the whole shot can fit into this frame here. And then when we reverse that, we're scaling it back up. So it's being scaled down and then up. And as you can see, it's taking a pretty significant toll on, uh, on the image and we've lost a lot of fidelity. So obviously there's no reason why we would accept this sort of image loss on our hero character just for the purpose of removing markers. This is marker removal and all we want to be outputting 
here is the patches that are going to cover up our markers. And we can do that as we've done before by outputting an alpha from our paint node. And then grading our alpha and pre molting it so we have our patch. We are obviously going to be suffering that loss of image quality on our patches, but because it's a, it's a green screen, there's no detail to preserve and we don't care about the detail anyway, so it's not an issue. What if we weren't doing marker removal though and we were actually doing work on Iron Man? and so we were concerned about fidelity of our plate. Is there anything we can do to preserve the quality of this image? Well, there's actually a fair bit we can do to reduce this degradation. But I think I'm gonna save that for a future tutorial where I can go into it in proper detail. But as I mentioned in the previous tutorial, um, it has to do with things like setting uh, different filter modes and using sharpen nodes and things like that. But sharpen nodes and using sharpening filtering methods can result in other problems. Hence why we should discuss it in more detail later on. So I'm sure you can see the value in this little setup here. Any method that allows us to take the camera move out of the equation uh, so that you're essentially working on a static shot is going to is going to dramatically speed up uh, your workflow and it's going to simplify the work massively as well so I highly recommend it cool and that's it for this little lesson I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something